Welcome, I'm Sarah Bowder, SDSU Agronomy Field Specialist, and I'm here with Warren Rushi, Extension Feedlot Specialist. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about silage, high moisture corn, and earlage options um, during this series where we've been talking about dealing with drought stress crops and how to salvage drought stress crops. So I'm gonna turn it over to Warren to talk a little bit about what we should be considering before we make decisions about silage, earlage, or sure. maybe some high moisture corn. Well, we're gonna start, and we're gonna take them in exactly that order because typically that is the, our harvest order, silage first, then earlage, then high moisture corn, then dry corn. What sometimes becomes challenging is those harvest periods often overlap. So we, in some cases, we're gonna, we have to make some decisions of what harvest methods are we gonna use because we may not be able to actually do all of them. So let's start talking about silage and with a particular emphasis on some of the drought stress we're dealing with now. Right now, we have a lot of people making some decisions on whether or not to, uh, what to do with the, the corn that's in the field because there's either little or no, ear, no ears, or a few ears or simply uh, unacceptable quantity or we need to find some feedstuffs. So the first thing I've been telling folks is they need to uh, evaluate uh, what their moisture content is. Uh, what I'm telling people is that the drought stress corn is wetter than they think it is just on visual appraisal. Even though I know the husks, you know, the leaves are brown and, and dry looking and you think that it's awfully dry, there's a lot of moisture left in the stem. So you know, what we want to do ideally is um, you know, either do a, you know, harvest some test strips or you know, chop up some plants, figure out what the moisture content is and then work from there. Uh, my, my minimum or my my minimum dry matter content target would be 30% or 70% moisture. If we're at that point, we can start working and it, we know it's going to get drier. If I'm going to be the, so the other part of this though, in this whole moisture discussion is, you know, if I'm going to be making a mistake, I'd rather be later than, than wet. And I know that goes contrary to what uh, some people you know, view as the correct approach, but if we're harvesting silage that is, Wetter than 70% moisture, we increase our risks of uh, clostridial fermentation, excess butyrate, it's not going to be preserved as well, not going to same, have the same pH drop, uh, may have some problems with uh, you know, poor intakes, poor digestibilities, possibly bloat storms and feedlot cattle. Uh, so I'd rather be a little later. One of the unique challenges we're going to deal with this year is I, I fully expect we will harvest dramatically more acres of corn silage in 2021. Than we would have other years. Not intended. Not intentionally, but you know, this is the hand we're dealt. Yep. The the challenge is going to be for not everyone, but for an awful lot of people, they rely on custom corn that's done on a custom basis. So those crews are they're booked up or getting booked up. And so you might not hit the ideal target. So what happens if we're late? Well, now you know, We've done some work at SDSU on some, feed, some trials. Now this is in finishing cattle at a relatively low inclusion rate, 15% of diet dry matter, comparing a normal or the ideal, the target harvest date, and then one that was two weeks later. Uh, when we went later, it was 7% uh, drier than what the first date was. And we saw no difference in those cattle. Now that may not be true in every instance, but I think by and large, we should be, I think that'll hold true. Because with the delayed harvest, we got more starch accumulation, so greater energy content, less fiber, more starch. The, the challenge with the delayed harvest isn't so much what the quality of the corn plant is or the nutrient composition, it's can we get that preserved. Uh, drier silage is harder to pack, uh, harder to exclude oxygen, so it's more susceptible to aerobic instability. One approach to deal with that, there's two. You know, we could add water to it which is hard to do. Hard to do. There's a hassle factor. You know, we gotta you know, use, probably use a mixer wagon and use that scale. And, and at, at the speed of a commercial custom chopping crew, it's probably not practical to do. I know a lot of sources uh, say the garden hose isn't enough. You'd need right, you need, yeah. you know, you know, and we can talk about that. That is, it is an option on some of the high moisture corn because yeah. now we can do a point source right at the grinder, sure. but we can't do that real well on the silage. The other option is we'll just chop it finer so we can pack it. Now I know that goes against some of the more recent conventional wisdom on how we chop silage. And it depends too, it depends very much on what we're feeding it to and what else we're feeding. 
if we're talking dairy cattle, what I'm about to tell you makes no sense. And you're probably all the dairy audience is going to go, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. However, if we're feeding beef cows or growing cattle or finishing cattle, if and especially on the cow calf and the growing cattle where we're also feeding some other ground roughage that might be low quality, longer particle length, we can get away with chopping the silage finer to pack it easier. And I know you and Kiernan on the you know those on the test silos that you guys did with different harvest, different packing densities, different harvest lengths, it was a lot easier to hit those targets with the shorter shorter chop length. Yeah. So if I am feeding a set of stock cows or a set of feed you know, or finishing growing cattle where you know, I'm less concerned with with affected fiber, the and I know we've missed the target, we're drier than we want to be. I'm going to tell the chopper to uh, put the shove the knives close together. Let's chop it finer. Yes, it's going to slow things down. No, they may not prefer that. But in terms of our ability to be do a better job packing the silage, that's going to be the, the better approach. Definitely. And I think you've covered a lot with the silage. I mean, one of the big heavy hitting things that you've talked about that I've had a lot of questions on is people assuming that their silage is dry now. And like you said, just because the ears are, or excuse me, because the leaves are drying down doesn't necessarily mean it's as dry as you think. Check it. We say three quarter mils is a trigger to start checking moisture. You know, so yep. check your moisture. It might not be as dry as you think. And the, the challenge though this year is a lot of these cases, there is little no ear there to check. Right. So right. now we've got to go by you know, color and it's really hard to do. Yep. And we, you know, this, we're, we're doing this obviously from Dakota Fest and we've had some conversations with growers that, and I've heard some stories where they went out, they chopped it, thought it was fine. Now they pulled a sample and it's 72% moisture. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be running. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's less than ideal. So yeah, let's, you know, you know and also re, you know, reality is also that if you're, if your crew is showing up, you know, you hate to send them away and I get that, but let's find out where we're at. Uh, one rule of thumb that uh, I've seen in print and I think holds reasonably well is about a half a percent per day. Yeah. So you know, maybe one way to look at that is if it's at 75% moisture, 10 days from now we're at 70. We hope. Uh, we I hope. mean, but if we don't have ears, yeah. we don't have to search. So yeah, it, it's best just to be checking. Yeah, be yeah. checking. Uh, we don't want to be, we do not want to be too early. Right, exactly. And I. I think those are great points. You now you, you talked about putting up the feed and the moisture. One thing we haven't talked about is packing and covering. Uh, what are your thoughts? I know we just had a forage field day. We talked about silage and we talked about keeping those layers to six inches and, and getting enough packing pounds to get your 15 cubic, you know, the 15 pounds. 15 pounds of dry matter. Yeah. Cubic, but yeah. Yeah. What it really comes down to is, you know, more weight on the tractor, more tractors, more hours on the pile. Um, you can't overpack. You cannot overpack. The and, and, and most importantly, it's the pushing up. It's not the driving over the top. It's the continually pushing the, you know, in thin layers, taking each load and pushing that up on the, you know, and keep packing that wedge. That's where you where you're increasing the density. Um, you know, maybe the the bright spot in the fact that the yields are less is that you know our tons delivered to the pile per hour will be less, which should let us do a more effective job of packing. Which might also help us compensate for that dry corn silage if we're stuck with that. Uh, but yeah, that you know, yeah, that yeah, the rule of thumb is uh, 800 pounds of tractor per ton per hour, uh, which I know gets into some math, but you know, it's basically you know, the heavier the tractor, the better. You may need to do some things like putting some weights on, adding some ballast to the tires, uh, maybe adding an additional tractor. It, that's been one of the challenges in the last you know decade or so as we've moved to higher capacity choppers. Uh, we haven't always kept up in terms of uh, our ability to pack the pile. And you know it's tough. I mean, if you've hired a chopper to come and your chopper's coming and they're going to chop as fast as they can because they're a custom chopper, it's really hard to get that back down. So like you said, you just more tractors, more weight. And in some cases, some of these better firms, though, they're providing the track, you know, they're bringing along the packing tractor also, mm -hmm. which is a huge benefit yeah. because they've, They've got something to at least to sit to maybe maybe carry the bulk of the load, probably with help from uh, you know, whatever equipment the grower, the, the feedlot operator, or cattle owner might have. So we've covered quite a bit on packing silage. Um, 
you know, putting up that silage, how about covering it? How do we want that pile to keep, right? Yes. So is it important to cover it? We see some piles not covered. You know where I was going with this? <laughs> it's critically important that's covered. And I get it. It is a nasty job. It's time consuming. Uh, this year, there are challenges with finding the tarps, uh, but it is, there are, you know, I come from the beef world and maybe the only other job that I can think of that is that is valuable per hour as chopping the silage, covering the, covering the silage pile might be implanting feedlot cattle. Uh, other than that, this is one of the highest value jobs you're, you're going to happen on the farm that year. Uh, and it's because of the, the amount of spoilage we prevent. It's important to remember, it's not just that black layer on an uncovered pile. It's not just the black layer you see, it's the additional loss in dry matter below that. It's not at all uncommon experimentally for us to show an additional 10, 20, 30% loss in dry matter or organic matter by not covering the pile. And that's where our nutrients are at. That is where the, and it's also, you know, we don't lose nutrients in, in dry matter equally. It's not that we lose fiber, we lose the, the non-structural carbohydrates and the starches and sugars and the high energy valuable parts of the silage is what we lose. So cover the pile. I, I understand it's it's a hard, nasty job. No one likes to do it. But you know, it's it, it, the alternative is it, it's really a, a lot like taking a cornfield and plowing under 15, 20 percent of it. Yeah. That's the set you're doing the exact same thing. Um, you know, and it's just you know so yeah, yeah I can't stress that enough. You did the work to make the investment, you know, just because you don't see the loss of it. Yeah, there. it's there. I, I feel like a lot of producers will tell me, well, I did it, it worked, you know, in any situation, not just silage, but I did it, it worked, it's fine. And, you know, we're not seeing what we're losing in this case. Right. So it may have worked, uh, those cattle may have grown, but maybe we can do better. Well, and, and what it comes down to is you've, you know, you've increased cost of gain, you've, you've yeah. reduced your margin. You know, there's all of those things that, you know, we've, you know, that those benefits you could have by doing a, by making some small changes uh, yeah. that would, you know, those all eventually make it to the bottom line. Yep. I just read a study uh, before we move on to your age, and I know that I believe it was Wisconsin and, and Kansas State had done a similar thing, and they found that it was about, and now this was done about 10 years ago, so numbers changed a little, but it was 7.8 to 1 for, for every $1 you spent on the tarp, you saved about 8. Yeah. Uh, and your silage. Yeah. So, of course, that's a rolling figure. But and, and in a year like this, where we know the feed supply is going to be short, uh, especially for things like dry hay and, and so forth, uh, they're, they're, going be, they're going to be short and expensive. You know, if we can preserve what we did manage to harvest, yeah. uh, that you know that it prevents us from having to buy some additional. Yeah. So, I think we covered silage pretty well. You know, I there. Uh, I'm sure there's some similarities with earlage. What do we need to know about that? You know, earlidge, again, it's the, the moisture content. And I, I don't have this number in front of me. But, uh, to be honest, I've been focused on silage. and I've, so, But it's going to be in the high 30s. A little drier. A little drier. This one, we, you know, when I talked about on silage, I don't want to be too early. On uh, earlidge and high moisture corn, I don't want to be too late. We need to, you know, there's a tight window. And if we do that correctly, uh, our starch availability goes way up. Uh, we get increased in energy content compared to dry corn. You know, there's a lot of really good, great benefits. Um, the, but if we're late, now we're, we don't get some of that. We lose a lot of those. We don't have the same increased in energy content. Uh, you know, so that's kind of where that critical window is. And why I talked about on there, you know, when we started, that you know, it may sound great on paper to say, we're going to chop silage, and then chop some earlage, and then harvest wet corn. It's really difficult to do all of those in practice. Yeah. I, I, in my opinion, you you may be able to do two out of the three. Yeah. Um, you know, silage and high moisture corn probably doable. Um, earlage and high moisture corn, you know, earlage in with the other two may be a challenge, uh, just because they, they things overlap. Unless you have multiple crews, uh, you know. And the nice thing with earlage is there's lots of different ways to do that. We can you know, put a snapper head on a forage harvester. We can do some things with, uh, you know, with changing how we set the combine even to, yeah. Yeah. you know, just to mix a lot of, you know, more cob. Uh, so from that standpoint, you know, things are doing, things are less challenging. And maybe we should step up a bit or step back a minute for producers who aren't familiar. What, what's the big difference between silage and earlage? 
with uh, silage, of course, we're taking everything above wherever the cutter head is. We're taking uh, uh, the entire plant with the exception of what we leave behind. With earlage, we're taking the cob and then some portion of the ear shank and or husks. Uh, earlage or snaplage sometimes gets, you know, the definitions yeah. get a little fuzzy because it depends on what, and then also then, you know, that also then affects the, the, uh, the nutritive value because it depends on how much of the fiber we're harvesting. The nice part about it, especially in something like finishing cattle, is we can use earlage to satisfy a large portion of our roughage requirement. So it's a really versatile feedstuff, mm -hmm. uh, but you know it's you know there's some you know, some some quirks in terms of you know, valuing and harvesting. A little, it's a little more of a slippery description compared yeah. to either silage or or corn. Yep, definitely. No, I think that, like you said, it's got some similarities to silage and how we store it and and feed it, but. Um, it's it's difficult to do all three. Yes. So we've talked about silage and earlage. What do we need to know about high moisture corn? So high moisture corn again, we're you know we're going to be targeting somewhere around say thirty two percent moisture. Um, some of the same similarities apply. Uh, we haven't talked about inoculants, but I would certainly definitely use those on the earlage and high moisture corn. With high moisture corn, if we're storing it in a bunker or pile, it needs to be ground, uh, either rolled or hammer mill. Uh, both there's pros and cons to both. But we do need to process that before we put it in the pile. And we're doing that to reduce particle size, to let us pack it better and eliminate oxygen. Um, one nice thing is I rarely, if ever, see an earlidge or a high moisture corn pile that's not covered. So, you know, I think. So his suggestion is if you're putting up a lot of, say, high moisture corn, might do start with one small pile, uh, get it covered, packed, and then set it aside, then do the larger pile. And then by the time that's completed, the smaller one may be ready. Depends on how much you're putting up and so forth. But you know, high moisture corn is you know, a bit of a, the ace in the hole, at least from a cattle feeding standpoint here in the Northern Plains. If we do that correctly, we can have an energy value that comes very close to what, what they observe with steam flake corn in the Southern Plains. Only we can do it without that added investment in uh, milling equipment and, and energy costs. Very interesting. And I think high moisture corn over the last like, 10, 15 years has become more popular with pea grasses and egg eggs and sea eggs. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's used fairly commonly. And, and one of the, in a normal year, one of the real advantages is it lets us start corn harvest early, lets us save the drying cost and the shrink. Uh, all of some of those hidden costs to dry corn that don't always show up but are certainly real as we start thinking about you know harvest inefficiency by waiting for the dryer or paying for the net propane to do that mm -hmm. or paying the drying and ship car, ship, drying and shrink charges when we're delivering. High moisture corn lets us eliminate all that. So there's some you know some system wide system wise efficiencies to be gained by doing this. So we, we covered all three topics. I think one big thing just to mention, and we might have mentioned it earlier, is nitrates. It's dry this year. So when we put up corn in this fashion, do we need to worry about nitrates? When should we test if we should? Um, we, we always have to at least inside. I'm not worried about nitrates in the high moisture corn or uh, because it, they're less likely to be accumulated in the cob and in the ear. And, and frankly, if we have enough if, if it produced an ear that's large enough to justify harvesting by mo those methods, we don't have to worry about, you know, there's Should not a nitrate. The, nitrogen. the nitrogen's yeah. used up. So I don't worry about that. On, the, some, on this drought stress corn, yes, we have to be concerned about it. The, one of the reasons why using drought stress corn as silage works so well is when the inside process works correctly, we'll, re, we'll eliminate you know, up to a half, you know, quarter to a half, of all the nitrates uh, will be uh, will be essentially used by the microorganisms during fermentation uh, and end up in being you know, single cell protein uh, for the animal to use. So if we can, that that's some of, some of the reasons why we stress moisture content as much as we did is we want to make sure that's right so that we get a good fermentation. 
from a testing standpoint, we could test it early. And, and the value there is if it if it's so exceptionally high that we start you know, doing the math to say, well, let's let's cut this in half and it's still in the extreme right. category. Uh, that's probably something we don't want to be working with. On the other hand, there may not be enough plant material to justify harvesting a solid jar. Right. The more the the more useful test is going to be after a 30 day or so fermentation to see what the final what before the end before you feed what that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we we know we expect for some reduction. We don't always know how much. Um, the one, and that's the reason why some of that you know, this discussion of quality of fermentation happens is if that doesn't go well, we may not get the reduction in nitrates we're expecting. Mm -hmm. So that's why that moisture content is really important. Uh, 10 years ago, or in 2012, we had, you know, we had another one of these droughts. Uh, this was you know, a former coworker, Jim Kranz, that shared with me here at Dakota Fest that someone had brought in some samples where they had harvested it early, too wet. And after they pulled, opened up the pile and tested it, it was it had actually increased the nitrates during that three days. It just and, and I would attribute that to uh, too early of a harvest, yeah. and so just didn't ferment like did it not should've. ferment like it should have. Didn't get that used up. Uh, so that's why we've we talked as much as we did about moisture content. That's really one of the key factors of dealing with nitrates. Just want to get it stored well so we get that fermentation. I think that, that really makes sense. And we do have another segment on nitrates if you want further information on that and how to test. I always say that, uh, you know, a nitrate test for the cost of the test, even to do it when you're chopping and you do it again when you open the pile or bunker or the silo, it's certainly worth, you know, the abortion of a cast or cattle dog. That's right. And, yeah. and because, and it's important on, you know, where I know when some of the other speakers we've talked about grazing, where we're relying on the animal's mm -hmm. ability to select certain parts of the plant. Uh, that lets us maybe use some feed stuffs that might be higher than what might be ideal. When we're feeding silage, we're feeding it all. So you know that's why we need to you know, try to figure out what what our risk level is yeah. uh, and determine you know are we is this something we need to dilute out or mm -hmm. are we only feeding this to the, to the young stock that aren't pregnant or right. um, you know, did everything work and we can use this without limitations. I think this has been great information. Mara, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, you know, I, I think we've covered most of it. Uh, again, you know, if there's any questions that come up, uh, then this is one of those challenging kind of years, but it's the reason why we're here to help. And so if there's something that comes up, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us that have been participating in this webinar series or uh, that sit there, uh, work at South Dakota State University in the Crops or Livestock area. Uh, we'll do all we can to assist you in, uh, in providing information you need to fix your problems. And I think the last thing I'd add is we talked about some things that really remove, especially silage, we're removing a lot of biomass from the field. Um, and so something to think about is to check out our cover crop segment in this recording series, because we really want to get something out there to protect that field for a lot of reasons. But this year, especially with our dry weather, we really want to be protected from the wind erosion situation. Excuse me. And we want to add our uh, water infiltration as high as we can to, you know, collect as much water as we can this fall and this coming spring. So getting something out there, um, there's a lot of options for that. I know it's dry, but there's still some recommendations that may be a good option for you and your operation. So do keep that in mind if you end up doing something that removes all the biomass from the field. You know, and, and another option is even, you know, you know, there's no reason why we couldn't leave some strips to catch the snow or leave some Absolutely. ground cover. Yeah. Or, you know, and I've seen a lot of these fields that are really up and down and some of those areas that are awfully short where there just isn't much there, you know, maybe those would just leave in the field and yeah. cut around them. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes that's easier said than done, depending on, you know, how many things we want to cut around. But, you know, that is a possibility as a way to, uh, you know, to control how much, you know, where we might leave some additional biomass. Absolutely. Yeah. So the goal is to get you some forage if you need it. If not, we can always leave some of those field crops standing. Um, and if we remove everything, we want to get something back out there for some nutrient cycling. You know, even your manure would be great to get back out there. So thank you to the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition uh, for partnering with SGSU Extension on this effort. And we hope that we can see you sometime soon at a, a farm show like this one or at a program. If you have any questions, you can contact us at extension.sdstate.edu. Um, click on Our People. Thank you. Thanks.